People very often ask me both how and why I started my podcasting journey. Well, as an engineer, I'm frankly very passionate about math. I wanted to find somewhere to share stories of great mathematicians from Archimedes to Alan Turing and everyone in between. And for that reason, I want to tell you a little bit about the, my preferred hosting platform, which is Zencaster. Now, before I continue, this is usually the conversation I have with anybody who is wanting to start their own podcast. I know there are so many people out there with passions that they want to share with the world or unique knowledge that they're just looking for a platform to start with. And uh, Zencaster is a wonderful all-in-one platform. What I mean by that is you can do your recording and your editing and use AI to create a transcript uh, and, and uh, distribute to all platforms, including Apple Podcasts or Spotify or anywhere else where podcasts are played. For anybody like me who might worry at first about what you might sound like on an audio recording, Zencaster's post-production process makes you sound really, really smooth. It automatically removes any of the ums or ahs in your recording. It removes any of the awkward pauses in conversations, and it also helps you to set the right podcast loudness and levels while reducing any background noise all with the click of a button. It couldn't be easier. Go to Zencaster.com forward slash pricing and use my code breaking math and you'll get 30% off your first month in any Zencaster paid plan. I want you to have the same easy experience I do for all my podcasting and content needs. It's time to share your story. Fairly often I get asked questions about how I got started podcasting with the Breaking Math podcast. And I'll often be asked this question by those who are thinking of starting their own podcast. That is, people who are looking to tell a story or share their unique wisdom with a larger audience or their passions or maybe just advertise their business or services. I usually like to start this conversation by either showing off or telling about our preferred podcasting platform, Zencaster. Zencaster is essentially an all-in-one podcast hosting platform. On this platform, you can do everything from recording your episodes to editing your audio and uh, video files to distributing your podcast to all podcasting platforms, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and wherever else podcasts are played. Now, there's more. Uh, when I first began podcasting, I used to get very nervous about how, how I would sound. I would sometimes stutter or have awkward pauses or uh, or other audio blemishes in my recordings. Uh, now, Zencaster has a new suite of AI tools in their post-production process that make you sound really smooth. They automatically take out any of the ums or ahs in your recording. Also, they automatically take out any of the awkward pauses in your discussions. The tools will also help you set the right loudness and balance all the levels while reducing any background noise all with the click of a button. Doesn't sound too bad, does it? You really should check it out. Really, the world needs to hear what you have to say. In fact, I'm going to give you a code below to help give you a large discount. It's all one word, breaking math. Go to Zencaster.com forward slash pricing and use my code breaking math and you'll get 30% off of your first month in any Zencaster paid plan. I want you to have the same easy experience I do for all my podcasting content needs. It's time to share your... Hey everyone, it's John from Breaking Math. Before this episode begins, let me just correct an error I made about 10 minutes in so that you're ready for it when it comes and it doesn't throw you for a loop. I said that two entangled photons, photons that have the special property that they act like one another even at a distance, go through two polarizing filters. I meant to say that if one entangled photon goes through a polarizer, then a photon entangled with it will go through a similar filter. And if, neither, and if the first one doesn't go through, then the second one won't go through either. Got it? Good. Now on to the episode. The history of physics as a natural science is filled with examples of when an experiment will demonstrate something or another, but what is often forgotten is the fact that the experiment had to be thought up in the first place by someone who was aware of more than one plausible value for a property of the universe, and realized that there is a way to word a question in such a way that the universe could understand. Such a property was debated during the quantum revolution, and involved Einstein, Polotsky, Rosen, and Schrodinger. The question was, do particles which are entangled know the state of one another from far away, or do they have a sort of DNA which infuses them with their properties? The question was thought for a while to be purely philosophical until John Stuart Bell found the right way to word a question and proved it in a laboratory of thought. It was demonstrated to be valid in a laboratory of the universe later. So how do particles speak to one another from far away? What do we mean when we say we observe something? And how is a pair of gloves unlike a pair of walkie-talkies? All of this and more on this episode of Breaking Math. Episode 28, Bell's Infamous Theorem. Hi, 
I'm Jonathan, and today we have on uh, my cousin, Adam. Hello. And Adam, how are you involved in the sciences? Uh, so I have been studying engineering at New Mexico State for about nine years now, working on my master's in mechanical engineering, and uh, should be done in the next year or so. Awesome. And uh, today we're going to be talking, of course, about Bell's theorem. But before we do that, I'm going to give a quick plug to Arts Academy in the Woods in Fraser, Michigan. Uh, Breaking Math is doing a little bit of somewhat of a cl collaboration with David Fuchs, uh, who contacted us. And uh, it has to do with um, prerequisites and standards based grading. Uh, more information on that as it unrolls. All right. So polarization. Polarization is like going the same way, but I think we could be a little more specific than that. What do you know about polarization? So if you can imagine light being a wavelength uh, going up and down, uh, that light isn't necessarily going up and down in the same plane as if you have a ray of light. A light will, could be uh, rotated. You're talking about rotating the light like a screw. So is light, So would you, consider in this analogy, would you consider light kind of be to be flat no, it, you can consider like all of the uh, waves kind of like a tube, like a 3D tube, uh -huh. uh, vibrating light. So uh, there's something to be said for circularly polarized light, which is light traveling like a slinky. But w I mean, for the purposes of this metaphor, we don't, I mean, for this problem, we don't have to be concerned with that light. We just have to be concerned with like, if you draw a wavy line uh, with a pen, that is the kind of shape that we're saying that light has and there's a d instrument called a polarizer that lets through half of light like um the brightness of light and it um changes it to polarized light in uh, in whatever direction and you could rotate this polarizer uh how would you explain a polarizer so a polarizer uh, as far as i know about it i don't know much i'm only a mechanical engineer so don't do much with light but it forces the light to either uh, go in the direction the polarizer is being polarized or it doesn't allow the light that is not going in that direction to pass through uh, the direction the slits of the polarizer are facing. Well, I know that's almost uh, the, I, the, the only addendum is that because it's quantum mechanics, um, you get a little bit of weirdness because if we had like a, a grate that let through th that it, and we drop coins on top of it, most of the coins wouldn't be the going exactly up and down. So you'd expect the vast majority of coins to not fall through the grate. But about half of light gets through the polarizer. So what it does is it sort of creates a potential for light to be up and down. And depending on how up and down the light already was, it either does that or not. And it's a form of quantum measurement polarization. So you're measuring something when you polarize it. And that's essentially what polarization is all about and um so if you polarize light can you have uh say you had like just a spectrum of visible light uh could you polarize it to only say have green light be the wavelength that you're allowing through and could you make like light that's on the fringes of the green wavelength kind of rotate to become in the green wavelength or does it just reject all of the other wavelengths if you have it that at that direction I think that uh, that would just be a filter. Oh, um, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. So, so, the, so then how does a polarizer, how is it different than a filter for, for that? I think the difference is that a polarizing filter filters uh, out basically a specific angle of light. A gel filter filters out wavelength instead. Okay. So like a polarizer will have a slit and if only light vibrating on that plane will get through and it can be any kind of wavelength. Yeah, although I think that they work best for specific, like, I think that there's, like, a specific polarizers for, like, I, I know that there's some antennas that take advantage of polarization, uh, things like that, so, and they have a different structure entirely than optical polarizers that deal with uh, visible light. What it does is it doesn't not let other stuff through, but it just doesn't affect it in the same way. It doesn't uh, collapse the wave function for different, for higher or lower wavelengths. Okay. And so like if you have a light bulb or any other kind of source of light, is stuff ever coming out of that source polarized or do you have to interact with it after it's been, say, emitted? Usually uh, radiated light is decoherent by my understanding. Okay. Th there are interesting ways of polarizing though. Like if you use a quarter wave plate, you can uh, polarize light uh, rotationally. 
so that it doesn't just have an up and a down component, but it has an out of sync left and right component. So it's traveling like a slinky. And so is this the kind of stuff that uh, Bell's theorem has to do with? Yeah, uh, what it has to do with is entanglement. And entanglement, you could generate certain pr particles with a, the property that they're kind of like brothers. And there's like some crystals, for example, that if you if you shoot light through it, you'll get two different beams of light coming out. But the photons that make up those two beams of light are entangled with one another. So if one phot if you just fire one photon at a time at this crystal, two photons at a time will come out. And if one photon passes through a vertical fo polarizer, for example, the other one will too. It gets weird when the polarizers are at different angles. Because the, the thing is about the entanglement property is that Einstein thought that it was like a pair of gloves where the gloves are like a pair to one another. So the particles have all the information in them that they need to know when to pa pass through a polarizer or not. So if they had the DNA that said they would pass through a vertical polarizer, they both would. And if not, then they both wouldn't. Einstein is saying like, like a pair of gloves, like if I start to move my hand in a certain way, then the other hand would also move exactly the same way. Uh, not, not, not necessarily like a pair of gloves in a box. Um, because the whole thing about locality is that things can only interact if they're like basically right next to each other. So he's saying that when these photons get entangled, they're imbued with the DNA, just like a glove has its pair. So it, it's just a way of look, looking at it. It's not like you move one and not the other, but it's um, it has to do with, um, I think uh, with electrons, you actually get like opposite properties or something. But I, I'm more familiar with the photon example. So I guess a better way of saying that would be that you just have two books that represent all the information. And it, when they pass through a polarizer, they look up if they're supposed to go through or not. So say so you had these two photons uh, both going at a polarizer and you only have like one slit. Where does the other photon go? Does it just hit, hit the wall and kind of not get absorbed by it or what? Oh, you're, uh, you're combining the entanglement with the double slit experiment? Oh, but what was the question again? So if you have two like photons and they're entangled, but you only have one slit, where does the other photon go if one photon goes through the slit? does it? Oh, does the it other one might not go through the slit because their position isn't entangled. It's just their properties are entangled. So it's about... Um, so if you, if you make them go through a polarizer... Mm -hmm. um, like let's say we have two vertical polarizers on the table and we redirect the photons to go through them. Mm -hmm. If the polarizers are at the same angle relative to one another, then the photon will go through both or go through neither. Once um, the photons get entangled, I, I mean like once you interact with one of the photons, they're no longer entangled. But you also know that, but you know the property of the other one. Now here's where it gets weird. You can't communicate faster than light using this and you think you might be able to because... Um, if you if you have to if you know the state of the other one as soon as you measure the one that you have you might think that you have information from far away but you can't do anything with that information you still have to send a photon to the other person to tell them what the outcome was and by that time you don't, you're not violating causality at all that's why that kind of quantum communication doesn't actually make sense in, yeah in, which a, is, in a communicating type of way yeah plus i mean plus if, if you could set up a set a bunch of spaceships going nearly the speed of light and uh, create a paradox using that, which I'm sure they did in, when, in many of their discussions. Because then you'd have information reaching people before they got there? Yeah, bas yeah, you'd have something happening before it happened, mm -hmm. which can't happen. Okay. And uh, the last thing that we're going to talk about before we talk about the inequality is the double slit experiment. Um, are you familiar with the double slit experiment? Yeah, is that like where you have like the two slits and then you have a distribution behind the slits of where the photons kind of end up and it's not quite distributed the way that classical physics would predict that? Yeah, so it's it's kind of like um, if I had a, a pool or a bathtub and in the middle of the bathtub I put a wall with two holes in it so that waves can go through the two holes but not other part of the wall... If I turned on the water, then it would cause a bunch of waves to go outward. And then when it went through the two holes, you would see the waves going um, up and down and they would interact with each other so that they would cause. So if you looked at the waves, they would kind of be all over the place. It would be like a crisscross pattern. Mm -hmm. It was thought that way that 
atoms had to be uh, not atoms that photons had to be a wave because they when you fire it through a double slit you get that distribution um so they thought okay if they're uh, particles then they wouldn't interact with each other in that way they would ha have kind of a it would look like a flashlight on the opposite side but they don't oh so they, they distribute in the way that the wavelength is in the shape of the wavelength yeah so these slits have to be very small and very close together so it doesn't look like a shadow on the other end it looks like their wavelength what it looks what it looks like is the shadow of a jack-o'-lantern if the jack-o'-lantern had closed teeth so it's like brightest in the middle it just kind of like a a pattern a pattern of waves yeah it doesn't look like a shadow of two slits right right okay so it so it looks like a like a banded line after the slits yeah with the brightest bands near the center okay if you only fire one photon at a time through you'll still get these this pattern which means that the photon must interact somehow with itself through both slits which is called the wave particle duality because sometimes things act like a particle sometimes they act like a wave that's the quantum weirdness that it seems to require faster than light communication because how does because once it gets to the wall how does it know that it's touching the wall there's so many questions that you could ask about quantum physics that people have tried to ask and you can't really answer with concepts that are familiar to to the yeah to people people don't have the hardware for it but math has been used since the beginning of quantum mechanics very heavily to understand it so to delve into what bell's inequality and bell's theorem really is we're going to talk a little bit about a property of inequalities themselves this is pretty much pure math at first all right so we covered it on the show before but set theory um what do you know about set theory uh well you're just taking a bunch of um say like venn diagrams and you're comparing what is in a set what is not in a set and maybe what uh things are intersecting uh, between the two sets like where the sets intersect yeah so um so for example the set of all continents would be north america south america europe africa asia australia and antarctica by some people's standards but if you intersected that with the set of all countries the only thing that would come out would be australia because there's no other country that's also sometimes considered a continent right right and then the set of all round numbers or whole numbers would have an infinite number of elements. And that's a in discussion in itself. But uh, what we're going to be talking about today is food. And these are going to be pretty American examples. So if you live in another country, just swap in examples of your own. You'll see as we go along. And uh, if you do have a piece of paper and pencil handy, um, then I would use it, but it's not required. Uh, but if you do, uh, we're going to be filling in a Venn diagram. So just draw three overlapping circles. All right. So we have a list of foods. Would you mind reading them? So for foods, we're going to have sandwiches, ham, iced tea, cereal, orange juice, Slurpees, and coffee. These are seven foods. So that's a set in itself. But we can be more specific with the set and we can break it down into three categories. So the three categories, three categories we're going to have are... Lunch foods, breakfast foods, and beverages. So if you think about it, sandwiches are lunch food, ham can be a lunch food, and iced tea could be a lunch food. Uh, cereal, ham, and orange juice are the three foods that are breakfast foods. And the four things that are beverages are Slurpees, iced tea, orange juice, and coffee. So there's a lot of overlap between them. So, for example, iced tea is both a lunch food and a beverage, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, we could break this down even further into seven categories and this is this is going to take a little bit so you're going to have to stay with us so for breakfast only foods not beverages the only thing that comes out of that set is uh, cereal when we overlap that with our main set yeah so if you're following along with the venn diagram you would uh put cereal in one of the bu bubbles that's not intersecting with any of the other bubbles and uh Sandwiches are the only food that we mentioned that were a lunchtime only food that's not a breakfast food or a drink. And Slurpees are the only drink that you don't drink for breakfast or lunch. Think of that as more of maybe like a snack kind of beverage. Yeah, snack beverage. 
Um, Which isn't a category that we're making, by the way. Yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll, although it could be a category if 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 those are the only three categories, because snack, I guess, is the only thing that isn't breakfast or lunch. Oh, I guess you could have dinner. <laughs> this isn't a complete analogy. Uh, it is for our purposes, though. So um, now we have left ham, coffee, iced tea, and orange juice. Mm-hmm. Now, orange juice you, is you drink that for breakfast, not lunch, right? Generally, sure. Well, I mean, okay, like you totally can, but most people don't. Yeah. Get everything you need for your next project today at Menards and save big money. LP Smart Side products are the number one brand of engineered wood siding. Smart Side trim and siding offers long-lasting performance and delivers the warmth and beauty of traditional wood. Save big money today at Menards and LP Smart Side products. Plus, visit Menards.com to view the weekly flyer and check out all of our great deals happening this week. Save and it's a beverage, so that would be in the part of the circle that's intersecting, uh, the the part of the circles that are intersecting where the uh, part that's not intersecting are both cereal and Slurpee. Mm-hmm. So drink and breakfast, and the thing that's a drink and for lunch is iced tea. The thing that's for lunch and breakfast could be ham, and then the thing that fits into all three categories is coffee, of course, because you can have coffee anytime. Somewhat disagree. <laughs> Some would, but they would be wrong. <laughs> so why are we talking to you about food so much? Um, also, please wake up. <laughs> we are talking to you about this because if we, like, let's say we have any three overlapping bubbles and we call them A, B, and C. The number of things that are in A and not B, plus the number of things that are in B, not C, is always greater than the things that are in A, not C. Now, that's a little hard to visualize, so we'll go through it with the example. Uh, what are the foods that are for uh, breakfast but not lunch? Foods that would be for breakfast and not lunch. Um, I guess we have orange juice in that category. Yeah, orange juice and we got cereal. Right. Um, okay. So we got two things. Now, what about the things that are for lunch but not drinks? Lunch that aren't drinks, we have sandwiches and ham. Yeah, and those are two completely different ones. So now we have four things. Uh, So that's A not B plus B not C, or Mm -hmm. breakfast not lunch plus lunch not drinks. Mm -hmm. And so how many things are breakfast but not, uh, are for breakfast but are not drinks? For breakfast but are not drinks, we have ham and cereal. Yeah, which is only two, and four is greater than two, right? Right. Last time I checked. So so basically we've proved a a property of sets. Um. And this is really important uh, when we actually get into the experiment. And the reason, and a little bit of a preview of the reason why, is because you can, if you go back to our polarized light example, you can see, you could say that it has DNA with, let's say, a million different variables in it. But you could make those variables fit into three different categories if you wanted to. Um, and the categories would be if it goes through a Vertical polarizer goes through a polarizer at 120 degrees, so one-third rotation, and a polarizer at 240 degrees. Um, and those could be your three categories. And those are degrees measured from a vertical 90 degree? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you would still get an inequality the other way, but it wouldn't be as dr- dramatic as an inequality. Welcome back, listeners. The... For those of you listening, we took a break, so <laughs> that's what's going on. This so is now, get cut right? Yeah, but we're totally gonna cut this. <laughs> so let's set up the experiment. In um, we ta- I talked about it a little bit, but I didn't go very good into it. Um, we have to start with a crystal or something that entangles particles. So we have to start with entangled pairs of, let's say, photons. Is there any kind of special crystals that'll entangle? Uh, these photons together. So it turns out that barium borate is such a crystal that exhibits um, necessarily nonlinear properties. Nonlinear properties just meaning properties that don't fit nicely into differential equations that have to govern it. But um, yeah, you can use a crystal like that to ge- generate entangled pairs of photons. And as a reminder, if two photons are entangled and they go through the same angle of polarizer, then they'll go through then they will either both go through or neither will go through, just reiterating that. And uh, then what you do is you have 
three different polarizers, one at vertical angle, one at 120 degrees, and one at 240 degrees. So they're like thirds. And what you do is you measure coincidences. And coincidence here meaning when the photon goes through both or when the photon goes through neither. Now, we don't have to test two types of polarizers that are the same polarizer together uh, because we know that it'll either the coincidence will be 100%, basically. They'll either both go through or not go through. So in this experiment, do we only have one slit at each angle? Um, uh, do you mean one polarizer at each angle? One polarizer at each angle. Is, that, is a polarizer not a slit? No, a polarizer is like a little piece of glass. With like a lot of like slits in it, like but so many that like yeah. Oh, okay. So they're like infinitesimally like a collection of infinitesimally small slits. Theoretically, yeah. Angle. Okay, okay. That makes that helps to visualize it a little bit better. Yeah. So what we do is we have three categories, and we're gonna call them uh, A, B, and C. A means this photon will pass through a vertical polarizer. B means this photon will pass through a polarizer at one third rotation or 120 degrees. And C means this photon will pass through a polarizer at two-thirds rotation or 240 degrees. Now, if something, if a photon is in category A but not B, that could be tested because we have entangled photons. And so the way we can see that result is by how they backscatter or how the how they end up displaying on the, the whatever is behind the slits. Oh, the, there's no slits in this experiment. The double slit experiment was just m mentioned uh, because... Um, it, it shows a property of photons being entangled. Uh, we're just measuring it with a simple photon detector um, behind a polarizer. So, okay, when I say slit, I mean polarizer. Oh, I see. So, so that, but I so, so saying slit is the wrong, yeah. wrong thing to say for that. Okay, so so there's a photon detector behind the polarizer, and and from that we can figure out which angle uh, polarizer uh, they went through. Oh no, we know the angle of polarizer they, that they went through. How do we know that? We put we set them up that way. Oh, and we test all combinations. Okay, and uh, we send a bunch of photons through each combination and test the percentage of time that it passes through. Okay, so you're testing. You don't have all three polarizers at the same time. No, just two polarize. Two, like maybe we might have a vertical and a one third, or a one third and a two thirds, or a vertical and a two thirds. So those are the three combinations that we could have. And so when you're passing, you're passing photons through, say, both of those at the same time? Uh, yeah, the entangled pairs. We, we send one in one direction, one in the other direction, and set them, and then they go through the polarizers and then hit the, uh, um, the photon detector. Okay, so you're saying we also have that fine grain level of control over beams of light that we can... Oh, yeah, we do. That's amazing. Yeah, isn't it? That kind of blows my mind a little bit. Yeah, we send single photons through at the same time uh, and uh, count their coincidences. And and we know, and we have enough control that we know when we're sending them and where we're sending them well, pretty precisely. Well, interestingly enough, um, we don't know exactly when we're sending them because we know exactly what energy they're at. Okay. Um, and uh, the um, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle says that the more you know about the time, the less you know about the energy and vice versa. So when you measure something or know something, you destroy something else? Yeah, but we do know generally that it does go through at some point in time. And we do know that a photon probably happened after a certain amount. So there's a little bit of engineering that goes into it. So we know enough that we can we can make pretty good measurements about this stuff. Oh, yeah, and they're getting better and better all the time. This episode is all about Bell's inequality and quantum mechanics. To that end, our partner Brilliant.org has a class on quantum mechanics called Quantum Objects. I noticed that it included some great material to supplement this episode on the section called Spin Class and the stern gerlach experiment. Actively working through this section cements a good foundation for learning more complex quantum mechanics. To support your educational journey in math and physics, go to Brilliant.org slash Breaking Math and sign up for free. The first 200 Breaking Math listeners get 20% off the annual subscription, which we've been using. And now, back to the episode. If we could set the photons into these three categories, then we could then we could kind of see if a photon. This is the classical view, by the way. Mm -hmm. If a photon is in category A, meaning vertical, but not B, meaning one third. Mm -hmm. If it if we send the particles through and we count how many go uh, vertical, how many go through the vertical and not the um, polarizer at one third, or I guess vice versa. It's just a not case, right? Yeah, it's just the opposite case. 
so then we have category B, not C, which means the fat photon passed through the one third polarizer and not the two thirds rotated polarizer. And then A, not C means a photon passed through the vertical polarizer while it's paired in polarized, uh, didn't pass through the polarizer at two thirds. So we're just doing all three combinations, but we have to stress that this is classical mechanics because quantum mechanics says that we can't know the exact state that the photon was in because the polar the pol the state that the photon was in has d data that we cannot access after a measurement and f and polarization does these measurements so this is where bell's test experiments come into play because since the categories are if a b and c are like the dna of the particle then we could test this by testing it in this clever way by entangling photons and seeing what uh, and then checking the um the likelihood that they're going to pass through things. We get more information than quantum mechanics says that we can. So when you say A, B, and C are the DNA of the particle, are you talking about like the uh, angle that that line, that the wavelength is kind of vibrating on? Well, it's more like uh, we're just talking about hidden variables. These are like, ver these are specifically variables that we know nothing about okay. uh, necessarily. So, if we're talking about the book example where the photons are like entailed photons are like books that have the same information in them, A would be a way of reading the book, B would be a different way of reading the book, and C would be a different way of reading the book. So it's kind of like saying you send these two particles and then you want to see if the book says that they should pass through A and you want to see if the book says that they should pass through B. Um, if you want both that information, you have to measure at the same time or not at the same time, but you have to measure like, you know, the same photon, which seems like you could do with entangled pairs of photons. But quantum mechanics states that since you can't know everything about these, then that theory fails. But what that implies is that non-locality exists, that these photons must be communicating at some point. When you say non-locality, I'm not quite sure so let's, what you mean by that. Let's let's say that um well a, a quick example is like let's say we're playing a, a game of cards with the devil, and the devil can look at and then uh, the devil can not look at the cards so you're just playing a fair game of cards with the devil and that's classical mechanics. Okay. But quantum mechanics says that the devil after drawing the cards can change their value. That's, and that's non locality. That's non locality, meaning that a measurement causes the information to exist in a way versus the information always quote unquote having been there even though it is there in a quantum way but um those variables are in are uh complex so is that different than the uncertainty principle so non-locality is when things can interact from a distance uh with their quantum states and the uncertainty principle is that position and uh, momentum or energy and time are uh when multiplied together have a maximum un have uncertainty i mean a minimum uncertainty that they have they're related but they're philosophically different so one thing about the inequality we said that a not b plus b not c is greater than a not c right um in the classical sense in the in the classical sense and um the way that this w works out is um if you manipulate these uh th this these probabilities these sets because if you think about a not b it consists of the things that are solely in a plus the things that are in both a and c but not b uh for example um and uh same thing with b not c it's the things that are only in b plus the things that are only in a and c so if you do that sort of manipulation you get a similar you get a similar uh probability that says that AB plus BC plus AC must be greater than one third. Now, what are AB, BC, and AC? AB is when it passes th through um, A and B with the same outcome, which happens one third of the time because there's eight di different possibilities. Um, BC one third of the time and AC about one third of the time or greater than one third of the time. And the reason why it's greater than one third of the time is because you have to assume that the variables are random. Um, otherwise, there would be some more measurable properties about the universe. So this DNA, th these, this DNA set, sets them completely randomly into categories A, B, and C, right? Mm -hmm. So if they're in neither category A, nor B, nor C, 
then no matter what, we'll get the same outcome for A, B, B, C, and A, C. Right. Um, but all the other times, uh, except for when they're in all categories, you'll only get one out of three being correct. Then that's where we get the one third. Yeah, that's where the one third comes from. And classical mechanics says that when you do this experiment, set it up, that the coincidences between A and B plus the coincidences between B and C plus the coincidences between A and C are greater than or equal to one third. Be so they're, they're greater than one third because of the of the, all being the same or all being. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, uh, but quantum mechanics, uh, because of some math that we really can't get into, but it has to do with, um, uh, path, path integrals. It predicts one quarter, uh, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what path integrals you use to do. If it, if you get an ex a result that's less than one third, it means that the categories can't exist and they have to, and that there has to be communication. So uh, when you set up the experiment and run it, you get a quarter. That's what you get. So in this, we are seeing that the classical probability just doesn't hold at all. It doesn't has no bearing on this. No, this is a an analytical result, meaning that you know it has a inequality. So yeah, then that's what it says is that you know it's 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 a make or break kind of thing, and it broke. Uh huh. Bell's theorem is the fact that non-locality exists and Bell's inequality is the inequality that we just covered. And so because of the way that the experiment breaks the classical probability that we're expecting, that's how we can see that the uh, non-locality is uh, having an effect here. Is that, is that it? Yeah, that's exactly it. Okay, cool. And it, it says it's I mean, we've talked about how the spookiness isn't as spooky when you realize that you can't communicate faster than the speed of light, but it still is difficult even to hold in your head. And it's and the fact that the universe is made out of quantum mechanics blows my mind personally, because we don't even have the math to properly represent that stuff yet. Well, not 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 with com in combination with um, general relativity, but right. Yeah, it's it. it it's so unintuitive that I think research is slower than it would be otherwise. That's why I'm a mechanical engineer. <laughs> Quantum mechanical engineer? Not, no, no, not quite. <laughs> Quantum mechanics has some bizarre properties. One so bizarre that we have trouble even comprehending the mechanics, let alone the implications of them. As we evolve as a species, we will evolve better ways to understand it. One thing is for certain, however. No matter what we are in the universe, it stands that we are and know we are. Quantum mechanics is merely the sharpest lens we have for looking at that. I'm Jonathan, and this has been Breaking Math. With me, I had today on... Adam. And Adam, is there anything you want to plug? Well, I wasn't ready for this. Yeah, nobody is. <laughs> no, there's nothing I want to plug right now. All right. Anything you want to say about quantum mechanics before we sign off? It kind of breaks my head trying to think about it, so... You're in good company with pretty much everybody. <laughs>